three, two. Hello, everyone. I'm Lori Beckman, Senior Editor of Production Machining Magazine. Welcome to the first of five Parts Cleaning Spark sessions that will feature presentations from parts cleaning experts on many hot topics that you won't want to miss. Today's session, titled New Cleaning Technologies Developed to Address New Manufacturing Processes, is sponsored by EchoClean Group. Thanks for joining us. The industry as we know it is changing rapidly, and recent events have shown that flexibility is a requirement in manufacturing. As technology moves away from traditional processes, parts cleaning also requires a different approach. In many cases, neither water-based nor vapor degreasing solutions are the right methods to remove residues from parts that have been created using alternative processes. This presentation will give you a good understanding of potential cleaning processes for unconventional manufacturing technologies. I'm looking forward to learning about this topic as well. Our presenter is Tyler Wheeler, Product Line Manager at EchoClean Group, who has been with the company since 2010. Today's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. It's easy to submit questions. Simply type your question into the chat pane on your screen, and we'll do our best to get to all of them. If you are not able to see the chat function, click on the full screen video icon at the bottom right of your screen. Then exit full screen to see if that fixes the problem. Today's session, along with other Spark sessions, will be recorded and will be available on demand through Spark platform later for you to view at your leisure. Now let's get started. Tyler, take it away. Hi, thanks, Lori. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I wanted to point out today I'm having a few technical issues. Um, we've had some issues with our power lines behind my house that had caught fire, so I'm kind of in a makeshift setup right now. So I apologize if, uh, kind of forewarning, if any technical issues do arise, we'll get those addressed quickly. Um, so with that being said, uh, you know, like I said, everybody, thank you for joining and wanted to walk through today. As Lori mentioned, we're starting to see a lot of changes throughout the throughout the industry where some of these processes that you'll see today may be new. Um, some of them maybe are becoming more prevalent, um, finding their way through the manufacturing chain where and, and other uses where you might not have seen them previously. So a little bit of, just quickly about myself, I joined EchoClean, uh, as I said, in 2010. I've been in multiple different positions. I started out in the mechanical engineering group, uh, held a couple of positions there. I was in part of the applications team before being the applications manager and uh, product line manager. And since then, I've kind of transitioned and I'm, I'm the product line manager with a focus as well on, on kind of some business de uh, development activities and focus on kind of new technologies in new market areas. Uh, if anybody has any questions outside of this, my email's here. You'll see it again on the last uh, on the questions screen, but feel free to reach out or post any questions that you have over in the side chat. Uh, so wanted quickly one slide on who is EchoClean. Uh, many of you may know, but others may not. So we are uh, you know, in, an, in an innovative industrial parts cleaning and surface processing technology company. That means we spend a lot of time and money on R&D trying to develop new processes um, and trying to stay on the leading edge of what's out there. And our company is split into three main areas. We call it one, the cleaning automotive side. This is traditional, um, a lot of robotic cleaning systems, big inline transfer systems, deburring, and from there, we're moving more into even decoding and active surface activation systems uh, for different powertrain components like engine transmission uh, with an automotive and even getting into aerospace and other uh, industries. Then we move over to what we call our, our CLI group, the cleaning industrial side. And this is your traditional call it basket type washers where you get uh, aqueous and vapor degreasing solvent um, machines. And, you know, there we, we process anything from machine components to fasteners to plastic components and, um, you know, a wide variety uh, of, of parts that may come our way. And then kind of the last group is what we call our cleaning precision group. And this gets into some very high requirement uh, systems where you get ultrasonics uh, into uh, these high requirement medical, optic, semiconductor type of applications with a wide varying 
uh, degree of parts lenses that you'll see prior to PVD coating and, and such as that. So I kind of wanted to set the stage so so everybody kind of understands who I am and you know who we are. So with that, I want to move on to some of the trends and the technologies that we see that are driving changes within the manufacturing uh, sector. And I think one of the first ones that I think most everybody would agree is the added manufacturing side. You know, it, it's been around for a while, but we're seeing it now mature and move from some prototyping type applications. And we're actually starting to see some production um, happening at a slow, but definitely an increasing pace. And the chart that I have over here on the uh, right shows as of 2019, this is just to be clear, this is the metal additive side. So not the entire additive side. It was estimated in 2019 that additive itself was about a $10 billion market. A lot of that has been on the polymer side, but it's been growing as well in the metal side. And you can see it's forecasted to, to have quite the rapid growth over the next 10 years. Um, kind of the next area that we see as well is an increase in bonding applications. So what this means is you know, bonding is something that's not new, but we're seeing it pushed farther and farther into other areas and industries. Uh, so that's an area that I wanted to touch on. Same thing it goes with uh, coatings. So again, coatings are nothing new, but we're seeing coatings used in different ways and in, in a greater variance of parts in, in places where it may not have been used in the past. Um, you, know, you can't talk about new industry trends without talking about industry 4.0. I'm not going to touch on this one too much, but I do want to make a point that, you know, one of the things that is a factor for us, and I, I know other cleaning uh, companies as well, is that customers are asking us for smarter and more connected machines, more sensors, more monitoring, um, process validation, and so forth. And kind of along with that is there's a, a higher demand for flexible systems. I think everybody, especially with the events of COVID, has seen a lot of changes in supply chains. Um, the ability to ramp up or ramp down and quickly change between products is becoming more important to not only smaller uh, machine shops and job shops, but all the way up at, you, through the tier companies. Um, so then one of the other big trends that we see, and this is more in the automotive sector, but it, we see the effects stretching across the rest of the industry is the EV market. So with EV comes multiple um, items. And, and that one of those is we see a lot more lightweighting of vehicles. So more composite materials, you know, gluing and bonding of body panels and structural components. Uh, again, not maybe new in some areas, but it's definitely, we're seeing a, a wider growth of those uh, technologies being used. And then even when we get into the new types of systems and components, you know, we've got battery trays now that are very complex, cooling cavities, uh, they have to be watertight, high cleanliness requirements, they maybe are, are fabricated out of aluminum extrusion and other materials that you now are bringing together multiple suppliers who maybe didn't interact before or suppliers that interact with certain technologies. Um, we got the motors and stators, uh, rotors, power control modules, the regenerative braking systems, all these actually have driven a need for some changes in the way we clean parts. And one of the last areas that we see is the sensors and electronics market tied to kind of EVs in your general automotive. Today, there's over 100 sensors in a typical car. And I've seen you know reports of that in some vehicles is pushing over 200. So along with that becomes not only traditional sensors, but now more mechatronic component sensors bonded into different areas of the vehicle. So all this is driving change. And what I'm showing over here on the right, this is, we can see the EV market starting 2010 to 2019. We've had a significant growth, but if we look at the, tr the further trends outside of 2019, you can see here's the growth we experienced, but again, through 2030, we're expected to see a massive growth um, in the EV market. So I'm expecting a lot of these uh, areas and, and technologies and manufacturing needs to start trickling down further through the supply chain. So I'm going to start out today on additive manufacturing. Um, for those of you who you know maybe are familiar with additive but do not know exactly what these parts look like coming out of a machine, what we have over on the left is a this is from a job box. This is uh, basically from an SLM, so a laser, um, a centered laser 
process. And what you see here, this big block is actually all uh, powder that with the parts surrounded inside. Now, what that means is we have to remove all the powder from the parts to even expose the parts. And then once we move to the next step, we've got complicated parts now that you know additive allows us to create unbelievable complex geometries that we couldn't create before. But the challenge goes on how do you clean those complex cavities? And as we look at the this next picture here, you'll see on some of these parts, the cavities inside are blocked with this powder because this actually builds layer by layer and any every nook and cranny of this part will be filled with powder when it comes out of here. So you've got, removing all the powder is becoming quite the, the challenging part of additive. And, and frankly, it's one of the areas that needs to develop farther for us to really move this into full production technology. Um, and over on the right, I just have a couple of examples of some of these complex parts. I've taken these at uh, various trade shows over the last couple of years, but you can see these internal cavities are extremely complex. And if you can imagine all these filled with powder, how do you remove the powder, guarantee that these areas are clean and that there's no residues that are gonna affect the end application. So now kind of taking that and looking at that, what does that actually look like in what we call the post-processing, everything after the printing phase, uh, and how does cleaning play into it? So you've got your first step. So we've got depowdering. So depowdering is gonna be, you could call it one of the cleaning steps. That's the bulk powder removal. Um, the next step I don't have highlighted here, but it's powder recovery. These materials are expensive. Um, and you know, if at all possible, the goal is to recover as much powder as possible and they'll mix a percentage of that powder into future batches of parts. Um, then we go to intermediate cleaning. So you might need to clean these parts up a little bit more before you actually separate them from the plate. And what I mean by that is all these parts are actually attached, they're printed on a metal plate and they have to be cut off. So before the cutting process, you might need to get everything cleaned up to a pretty good stage to make that uh, easier, less messy, and you know, kind of aid in the process. And then from there, you might go into a heat treating process. Uh, and finally, we've got the final cleanliness of these parts. And you know, if it's a say this part over here on the uh, oops, on the left, this frame, something like that's not super critical. If you have something like a manifold, especially something carrying oil or fluids, it's going to be much more critical that all these cavities are clean. And this is kind of the exact same thing, but trying to visualize it. And what does this look like in machinery? So you've got printers, you've got unpacking stations, which is basically uh, removing the build plate from the job boxes. And here is for us what we're looking at as a depowdering machine. And then you might go into a wet depowdering. And the reason you have to have a dry depowdering before wet depowdering is, I mean, think of this as very fine particles. And these fine particles can essentially cause, they'll turn to almost like concrete if, um, if they're not removed first. And depending on the final requirements, you might have a final cleaning and then ultimately inspection. And that's something I'll, I'll cover here in a, a future slide. So I wanted to show here, this is a demonstration part that we have that's been 3D printed. You can see these cavities inside. And the goal is, you know, get, how do you remove this, this powder from this cavity? And this demonstration part, it's, we've got metal uh, powder inside of a plastic part just so we can actually watch the process of what's happening. And in these cases, you know, we're talking very high levels of cleanliness, you know, of less than 75 micron. And when we get to that, this is actually a air-based process. So I'll play this video a couple of times here so you can see, but we're actually creating a suction that's forcing all the powder out of the part. Um, and this is one of the ways to try to attack these parts. So what we found right now is there's no single process that is perfect today for cleaning all powder out of an added part. It, it depends on the application, um, you know, the end use, the, uh, the steps involved in the manufacturing, what the geometries look like. There's a lot of factors that go into this. Uh, here's kind of a, another part that I want to show. So in this case, we're actually using a high frequency 
um, vibration to remove powder. So this part that you see over here on the uh, on the right is the same thing that we see on the left. And this image in the middle is actually what the internal cavities of this part look like. So it's very, very complex. And you know, again, how do we remove all that powder? So in this case, we're actually using these high frequency controlled vibrations to essentially vibrate the powder out of the part. And now I kind of want to get into the next step of, okay, you got the quality side. And what happens if you don't clean these parts? Well, here's a complex heat exchanger. What you've got in the first image here on the left, this part's been sectioned, but all these um, small kind of uh, triangular uh, structure that you see, th that's all support mechanism. Its only purpose is to, to support the part as it's being printed. And you can see it's got powder packed into different areas. But then when we actually look closer here, you can see powders build up on the inside and throughout the channel. So this is the biggest problem. This is where you got fluid actually flowing through this heat exchanger. You can see these are completely blocked. This is internal, so there's no real way to see this, which is one of the challenges on added parts. So, you know, we can clean them, we can do whatever we want, but without having a way to verify, it becomes a challenge. You can't section, of course, a completed part. So that's where some companies right now are actually going through and using CT scanning as a method. Um, and this is one of those technologies that's kind of developing with an additive of, you know, we need ways to do quality inspections. You know, the traditional millipore specifications that we would do on a machine part, they may apply, but again, there's no, if this powder is essentially turned to concrete in here, there's no way that that's gonna come out on a millipore test. So that's where technologies such as inline CT scanning and, and other things are being developed as well. So with that, um, you know, we're in the process ourselves of, as I said, we spend a lot on R&D and a big part of that for us is additive. We see additive as the future. Uh, it's gonna be a, a major change in, in the manufacturing side. It already has been in prototyping in other areas, but it's coming in production as well. And so for us, that's where we're developing different methods. And depending on the part and the use, we might see a variation of, of different types of technologies being used. Um, on parts. And along with that, you know, we're not only looking at additive for how do you clean it, but we're also trying to figure out how can we make additive improve the cleaning process. So when we look at this, we've got, I've got a few different pictures down here. We're using additive for trials right now. We, we do a lot of trials for customers. And as part of that, we're always trying to make specialized fixtures, or sometimes we run into situations where it becomes almost too complicated or too time consuming to run trials because we have to machine dedicated fixtures, um, which is you can be very expensive. Um, whereas now we can mock something up, we can 3D print it, and we can be running a trial the next day. We can design it up one day, we print it, we come in the office the next day, the fixture's ready, throw the part on, and, and we're ready to go. So it's really helped us from, from the fixturing side. Um, then we kind of move over to uh, what you see in the center here is actually a high pressure nozzle. Um, so those familiar with using high pressure deburring machines and the like, you know, the tools they wear, um, it's just the nature of the cavitation that happens at nozzles will eat them away. And what we're trying to do is one, not only give us flexibility in the types of geometries that we can address and the, the shape of our tools, but we're actually using uh, additive to give us more efficient and longer lasting high pressure tools. So the tool that you see here, this is this is a production tool that we're using in multiple customer sites. Um, and you know it's, it's all done with 3D uh, metal printing. And then over here on the right is from another one of our machines where this manifold you'll see in white is oops, is um, all 3D printed. So this is actually a two-piece print. It wraps all the way around, and it's a big drying halo is what this is. And this type of design actually allows us to create constant uh, velocity and, and, and uh, airflow all the way around the parts for trying to tr manufacture something like this through traditional means it gets to be very complicated. Um, you know, you're trying to weld it out of multiple pieces and you still can only do so much. Um, and it's always a, a balance of, of cost and performance. 
Whereas with this, this is, allows us to run simulations on Airflow and turn around and, and print the part. Um, so yes, like I said, we're, we're trying to figure out how do we clean additive parts, but we're also looking at how, how does additive change the way we clean? Um, and you know what effect does that have on the cleaning industry itself? And so I'm going to move on to the next area. Uh, you know, I, I do want to reiterate: if anybody has any questions, feel free to to post them on the side, and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, so here we're kind of moving on to the bonding and coding side of things. So one of the things we have to look at when we're in the bonding and coding side, for some people, some of this will be familiar. Um, for others, you know, it's again, it's moving into more areas of the manufacturing sector. So cleanliness is more than particulate. You know, a lot of people look at cleanliness as, okay, I need to achieve a certain milligram uh, or I need to achieve a certain particle size. But when we're starting to look at bonding and coatings, we need to look at the actual the, the surface energy. What is actually left on that surface? That's not showing up in those other tests. Uh, what we've got showing over here on the right is, you know, when we look at a bonding application, you're got your two substrates you're bringing together and you've got an adhesive and cohesive zone. So for that to work, we need a strong bond across the entire area. And that means we need to have uh, the surface to a, uh, you know, to very clean level. And with that is coming from what you see down here at the bottom, this is the wetting behavior of, of a substrate or, or a material. So if you have a very uh, contaminated surface, maybe it's kind of oily, what you'll see is adhesive or water or whatever the case may be on the surface will start to beat up. Um, that's not going to provide a very good strong bond to the surface itself. So as you get cleaner and cleaner, you can see it starts to flatten out. And this is essentially, it's, it's an increase in surface energy on these parts. So when we look at this, I think there's probably many that are familiar with dyne pens or dyne ink. This is the traditional method. It's a little bit subjective. You can have a 32 dyne, you can have a 35 dyne or a 38 dyne, and it's it can be very hard and it can be subjective of, uh, do you think a 32 passed or failed? Because you know the results will look something like this. And as you work through, there's no exact number that you can actually spit out on a report and say, this is what we achieved on a part. You either, the line <laughs> beat it up or it didn't. And, and so it gets to be a little difficult. And when we don't have the correct, uh, the correct dyne level or the correct surface energy, this is what we get. Over here on the left, you can see this is adhesive weighed down on a surface that wasn't clean enough. Now you can imagine if this is sealing, getting back to the battery tray example, you know, if, this, if you're trying to uh, depend on that surface and this bond to actually keep those uh, that battery tray watertight, well, obviously this is gonna be a problem. There's all kinds of areas where water could leak through. Same thing, if you're trying to bond two structural components of a vehicle together, you sure don't want all these areas of non-bonding to happen. I mean, that's a safety concern. So that's where we get into, you know, this is what it needs to look like over here on the right. And that's why it's important to, to clean these surfaces and to measure them. And so that's where we're kind of moving now into the next level of contact angle measurement. And it's been around for, for a while, but I think we're starting to see this a lot more prevalent. We're starting to see a lot more customers come to us and say, I'm getting these uh, request from my customer, these are the specifications, and I'm not familiar with contact angle measurement, or I don't have the tool. Uh, this is a tool we've got in our lab, but this actually allows you to, uh, it essentially injects micro beads of water on a part, and it can measure, if I back up a slide, it can measure what this angle of the bead of water is, and it will give you this contact angle, which is essentially uh, correlates to the surface energy of the part. And this will give us an exact number. As you can see in the example on the screen, you know, this part, it's reading out at 53.8 degrees. So that's a very specific number. We can see, we can set ranges of what's acceptable, what's not. And, you know, it, it's a lot more reliable method for for um, checking parts. And not only that, it's you're putting micro drops of, of water on there. You're not putting uh, ink 
on there that you then have to clean off. So kind of moving to the to the next step, I think a lot of the parts today that go through bonding and coding processes generally go through a multi-stage process. And that means you'll have you know the part, you go through the machining, uh, you'll go through a wet cleaning process, and then you may go through a plasma cleaning process to, uh, to clean the surface. And then you go into your coating and you know, you'll go to paint or bonding, whatever the case may be. And the problem with this is you need, you've got multiple steps, multiple pieces of equipment. It takes longer to move parts through. You've got more costs. And uh, for us, that's one of the areas that we're trying to focus on of, okay, is there ways to reduce the number of steps to make this more efficient? And when we look at this, we're trying to combine processes of wet and plasma cleaning and not only trying, but we, we've been able to successfully do it, um, which you'll see here in this next slide. So you've got plasma cleaning as a supplementary process. So, you know, again, we've cleaned the particulate off, but now you need to get that surface very clean before you put your bonding uh, material, your adhesive on or your coatings. So the plasma really does help with that and it helps remove the thin filmy contamination that you have but the important part with that is it's we're talking it's micrometers thick if you have too much on there it's a problem for plasma and other processes so skipping ahead here what we've actually been able to do through our r d process we've actually been able to combine for those that know the low pressure plasma process it generally happens in a vacuum well, we, we do a lot with our vacuum degreasing systems. And with that, we've actually been able to add plasma into our vacuum degreasing as a last step. So we already have the chambers, we already have the, the vacuum pumps. Now we can upgrade, we need to upgrade them a little bit, but we can go through all these steps and now we're actually integrating low pressure plasma right into the single machine. And that was an important thing that we were looking to do from purely a customer benefit standpoint. Now you've got one machine, that is doing the process instead of multiple steps. Um, you know, it's one piece to maintain, and not only that, it's a it's a cost benefit. You know, we can add with uh, call it relatively minimal cost to this machine. We can add the plasma process first, buying a whole standalone piece of equipment. And then outside of you got your low pressure plasma cleaning that happens inside of a vacuum. Uh, then we also have atmospheric plasma cleaning. So this is something that showing here. So this is a, a, a plasma process that we have uh, that we've worked with some institutes out of Germany on. And this is for activating um, or cleaning surfaces. Uh, in this case, what we're showing is this is a, a, a headlight that is being activated on the surface so that it can be coated with a scratch resistant UV coating. And you know that that surface has to be prepped first. And one of the things that we're shown here on the right, one challenge when you look at atmospheric plasma cleaning is that you are generally pretty limited to the geometry that you can handle. And what we've been able to do here, and with the partners of the institute, this technology allows us to to actually um, treat undercuts and other areas that may not have traditionally been able to be addressed. Uh, with a traditional uh, called atmospheric plasma process. So continuing with kind of the surface cleaning and, and bonding process, um, steam, we've had steam for, for quite some time, um, but it's again, becoming more and more popular in different applications and in different use cases, different parts that we, we haven't seen in the past. So what you'll see here is um, we've got steam that is from flat jet nozzles, round jet nozzles. There's a lot of different uh, things that you can do. Uh, what you'll, let me back up here. So this video you'll see on the right, this is actually the bipolar plates for a fuel cell. Uh, they need to be cleaned before they're laser welded together. So in this case, we're actually doing that with steam. Uh, and when you look at the steam, there's, we can look at, you know, how does the steam itself work? You've got the temperature, which you can control and you've got the velocity of the steam hitting the surface and how fast you're actually sweeping across that surface. And the other factor that you have to look at is how wet is that steam? So these are all areas that we are uh, working on every day on the best use cases and different applications. 
but this is as we find more applications and uses and components where we have this need, you know, this technology itself is continuing to uh, advance. And then from there, we kind of look at some of the coding processes. So when we look at coding, sometimes that might mean removing uh, material that needs uh, that's on the surface contaminating, such as here, uh, weld seams. You need to clean them before they are uh, they go into maybe a dip coating process. This is a subframe of a vehicle. Um, today, a lot of that happens with ceramic uh, blasting processes. We use contaminants. Uh, the part needs either to be blown off, cleaned after. Uh, it can be time consuming, and you've got the consumables involved. So this is another area where we're going, we've asked ourselves, what can we do to address this in a different way? And for that, we've actually um, developed this ultrasonic high pressure nozzle system. Uh, it's a combination that creates these pulses. Uh, and these pulses, this is on a high speed camera happening thousands, thousands of times per second. And that pulse actually allows us to go through and clean a weld seam, which you'll see down here in the bottom right. Uh, you know, this weld seam was cleaned with purely water. So we can actually do not only the uh, the contaminant removal that would normally happen with bead blasting, but now it actually moves on to cleaning together. So you know, I think that's kind of a big theme for us is how do we bring processes together? I think a lot of these newer areas, you know, or even the traditional areas that are moving out, uh, you know, everybody's looking at floor space, everybody's looking at capital investment, and how can you reduce the cost of putting in new equipment, new lines, and, and upgrading to newer technologies. You know, especially if you as a contract manufacturer have customers coming to you with new parts and it requires a, a high capital investment, you know, you're always looking at how do I minimize that? And you know, for us it's okay, how do we combine processes together to reduce the footprint and reduce the amount of equipment needed? Uh, so what we see here is this is actually what the surface of the part looks like after we've been through the, the last process that you had seen. And this is something we can control through a lot of different parameters. But in this specific instance, this part's actually being plasma coated. And so for that plasma coating to work, you really want um, a lot of these pits and, and, and little wedges and, and areas for that coating to grab onto when it sprays on the part. Typically, these are always dissimilar metals. So you need a way to uh, coat those together or to to kind of bond them together and get them to lock. And, and that's what we're showing here. So this is actually a, a cylinder liner that might be used in either a remanufacturing application or a large uh, diesel type of engine. And they're generally cast into blocks. Well, now, um, you know, we're looking at other types of, of processes here. And, and, you know, that's where you get start getting plasma and you get, uh, even for the casting process, when you cast these in, there's some people machining grooves, but you still run into an you know, absolute worst case failure. They could break loose. Um, it's very rare, but it can happen. So the manufacturers are always looking ways to better improve this. And, um, you know, again, this is you know, a bare liner. This is one that's actually been machined. And what you see inside of all these machine grooves, we've targeted the code or the roughening application just to the grooves and then the last one is actually a full part that's been grooved uh, and again this is only on water so you know we're able to roughen that and then with the roughening comes a cleaning naturally because we're already in a wet process we already have filtered fluid so we, we can go ahead and address the cleanliness of these directly after uh, and kind of moving with that is it's when I brought up regenerative braking systems, one area that we're seeing is on EVs, there's a need for brake rotors to be uh, coated with a superior anti-corrosion um, coating because the regenerative braking systems do a lot of the work. So the rotors aren't used uh, like they would be on a traditional vehicle, uh, at least not as often. So what we're starting to see is more and more coatings actually being applied to the rotors themselves. Well, to get that coating to actually um, to bond, again, you have to roughen the surface. So this is uh, an example here on the left with us taking this tool and a robot, and you can see we're actually spinning the rotor in a spindle. 
addressing the entire surface, which you see on the far right, and then it can go into the coating process. And along with the next step is it's, and it's been around, um, so may be familiar with it. For us, it's, it's a technology that we're using. Uh, it, we're working with partners on it, but it's important that, again, we're trying to bring multiple processes together and systems. So in this case, we have the laser cleaning and, and surface prep again. So here you'll see a video. This part is being um, cleaned and actually roughened before gluing of an electronic module or sensor. And when we look at this on a, uh, on a microscopic level, you can zoom in and you can see the, the structure of what this looks like and you can see this rough surface, which helps the adhesive to have something to grab onto and bond to. Oops, apologize. So the kind of the next area, some may be wondering why am I showing a global consumer electronics market slide, but it actually has a big impact. As as consumer electronics are starting to increase, we're, we're starting to see even the supply chain um, grow and grow into other areas and, and manufacturers that's maybe not used to this uh, to this industry. And what comes with that is in some of the electronic side, we can't use our traditional wet cleaning methods that we may have used in the past. So with this, we're using technologies such as CO2 for uh, removing flux after soldering or to actually remove small fine burrs from ultrasonic welding processes. So you'll start to see this in a lot of mechatronics components, a lot of sensors, uh, control modules, and the likes. So this is actually in our lab, we've got collaborative robot to do a lot of testing with, and, and you can kind of see what we're doing here over on the bottom right. We're trying to remove these small burrs off of each one of these uh, areas on the PCBs. And then we kind of move on. So we've got cleaning with CO2, but then we move on to cleaning with air. And this has been one of the, the biggest areas for us, whether you've seen some of it when you looked at the additive side, um, but it's got a lot of uses. And you know the problem when, you, when you're cleaning, when you're wet cleaning, if you make a part wet, now you got to dry it off. That's a lot of energy. It's extra cycle time um, and extra steps that if we can eliminate, that's great. So. In this case, we are um, trying to clean these parts with, with essentially a vortex in here that we've designed. And what you'll see is there's small little red, uh, red powder or flakes on this part. And this is a 3D printer. It's to simulate a PCB, but it's, it's done in black so you can actually see the contamination. It's much harder to see uh, on a traditional PCB just with the contrasting colors. So in this case, we're trying to reach under 100 micron. And what you'll see is when I start the video, these particles will start to be removed, but they're actually brought to the outside and then they're discharged into this cavity in the front. And what that does is it keeps the particles from recontaminating the part. We just took them off. We don't want to put them back on. So it might be hard to see, but in the bottom left, you can see all these little particles moving into this bottom chamber. I'll play that again real fast. So you can kind of see everything's being um, swept away, pulled off, and not recontaminating the part. And now kind of moving to the next step of, of air is actually cleaning a stator for, for an EV. Right, this gets it actually back into more of how are we using additive. Uh, here are some test nozzles that we made just for this test. It allows us to be very flexible, run multiple trials for customers, and, and play around with parameters pretty quickly that we wouldn't normally easily be able to do. So in this case, you can see there's these small metal flakes, and some of these get stuck inside of the hairpins as well and can cause issues. Um, so in this case, we actually have a two-step process. There's a vibration uh, process, which is what is attached to the, um, to the top of the stator there. And then we actually have, this is, these are all air nozzles. So we're combining the, the blow off slash kind of drag off uh, process and vibration together, again, to clean this part. But this part, we're achieving less than 1000 micron um, for metal particles and less than 2500 micron for fibers. And we're doing it all without 
any fluid and it's happening very quickly. So again, you know, this is how, do, how does the industry move forward on some of these things? And, and, you know, how do we look at cleaning some of these components that, you know, maybe weren't so critical in the past or weren't really looked at as much? Same thing here. This is the rotor for, this is for an e-bike, but it's a max of 800 micron. But in this case, these this is a different market. These parts are 7.6 seconds, uh, 7 second cycle time. So it's very quick. And what you can see between the laminated plates here, you'll see this one chip that's actually stuck in there and that can cause a problem. So, you know, with, again, here's 3D printed nozzles for, for our trials that we're able to do tests with. We're able to uh, use with these special designs of nozzles to be able to clean these parts with air. and this is what it actually looks like when you actually move into a production type of system. So this ultimately was cleaning um, assembled motors for an e-bike. Uh, we had to be less than 500 microns and they wanted to clean them before they put the, the ceiling cap on. So this has a 7.6 second cycle time. And this is a cleaning machine. It doesn't look like your tr traditional cleaning machine that you would think of. This is all being done with air. It looks more like an automation system, but this is, again, it's cleaning these parts before they seal them up at to 500 micron level. And then, you know, again, getting into combining processes, we find where in some instances we might need to do, say, if you're doing the fine deburring after the ultrasonic welds, we may need to go in and we first um do a co2 process and we need to combine that with the vortex or other process to remove the contaminant that we've just taken off the part so in this case you can see we're using a scara type of of robotic process it's moving around uh, this control module and we can address every single area we can be flexible change between processes and this is kind of the mindset that that we have to have with these newer areas again of how do you combine multiple processes to make the cleaning happen that needs to happen. And how do you do it in one step instead of, you know, going through one, two, three machines? I mean, every machine you add, that's more handling, that's more labor cost. Um, it's more chances and opportunities for something to happen and go wrong. And as we kind of look at, you know, what are we doing with some of this, you know, kind of go back to that modularization and flexibility. I mean, I think that's an important area for the en entire market right now. Um, and, you know, as I stated at the beginning, COVID I think has shown us that, you know, there's been a lot of ramp up, ramp down. Let's try to change over. Let's try to manufacture something else. Um, and we need flexible and modular uh, equipment. So this is actually, this is a CNC deburring and cleaning system that we have that has multiple modules. You can kind of see the lines, but the point of this is for us, this is really just a platform where all these new technologies we're kind of bringing together and we can plug and play in all these modules to be very flexible um, to what the parts are that's coming down the line um, and to what volumes are being run and so forth. So, you know, for us, it's it could be it's high pressure deburring, um, and roughening, it could be high pressure cleaning, it could be CO2 or plasma, or you know, integrating uh, air cleaning into systems like this. And you know, this flexibility has not only uh, it doesn't stop here, but it actually moves into even our precision products that we've moved to is kind of again rethinking, you know, what does a precision system look like when when you look at your big ultrasonic uh, machines that might go in a clean room. You know, the problem is. You might start out day one with X volume. You need to ramp up, but the systems are not flexible in that way to allow you to. So in that case, you know, you, you either have to buy too much machine to begin with, which is a lot of capital outlay, or you have to buy something smaller and then you have to spend more money later to replace it. So, you know, some of these types of systems, this is where, again, we're trying to look at being flexible, making these modular. So these are actual you can kind of see in all the images these are individual modules that kind of plug together and build a precision cleaning system and you know one of the last things i just want to touch on we've got these test cells for us this is 
this is really the future of cleaning. I mean, we've got vapor degreasing, it's not going anywhere. Uh, wet cleaning, it's not going anywhere. But as these new technologies, new components come our way, it does require different approaches and different um, steps. And, and in some of these applications, you know, there's not the long track record that we have uh, as an industry of looking at, you know, something that's been done for 10, 20 years. So for us, it's very important that we have the, the lab and capabilities to be able to run these different processes, find out what is exactly the best for a certain application and, you know, look at all these different aspects and maybe what do we combine together even as a multi-step cleaning process. So with that, I think we can move on to the questions. Um, I'd love to hear if anybody has anything. Great, thank you, Tyler. We do have a few questions here um, from Darren Williams. For your polymer fixtures for cleaning nozzles or airflow fixtures, which polymers do you prefer to work with? ABS, PLA, PET, or other? Um, I think it it kind of it depends on what we're actually doing with the part. Right? If if it's a static call, uh, fixture like what you've seen with maybe the blow off process, you know it could be at that at that point it could be a PLA um, because it, it's not going to be too critical. Um, if it's something that is going into a hot environment, you know that's where ABS um, or maybe a PETG uh, becomes you know more important of looking at. And so it's really one of those things that we have to kind of look at. What's the process? What are we using it for? Um, and, and not only that, how long do we want it to last? You know, so, so all those all those factors kind of come into play when we're looking at, say, a fixture. You know, if we're going to run a fixture, we know we want to use it for just one day of trials, and it's it's not too critical. You know, we'll, we'll change our print settings so we can print it faster, quicker, and, you know, at that point, we can turn it around and get it um, in the machine. If you need something that's going to last for a full week of testing, you know, that might change the approach that we take. Right. Okay. And then from Jeremy Salkin, are you able to 3D print plastic fixtures to be used in a production machine or just for trials? So we, we are using them in, um, in production machines. That's what the, the one slide that I showed with the blow off system that actually comes from that CNC machine that you've seen at the end. That CNC machine has different modules where each module can do cleaning, um, we do high pressure cleaning and then it can kind of work through. You can do cleaning, but it also it has integrated blow off. So that is actually the blow off manifold that you see the halo from the production machine. That's what's used in all the machines that we do. Um, and it's a standardized uh, tool that we're using. But at the same time, what's great about additive, if we have a special application, we can easily modify it, redesign it to be flexible for whatever production application. Okay. And then from Frank Conan, you focused on the AM part on particle removal for the part. Often those parts have to be CNC machined afterwards. What about cleaning after this process step? And can you do this with the same technology that manufacturers use for cleaning subtractive manufactured parts? Yeah, I think when we look at um, when we look at the machining side on these parts, you know, of course we have to think of what do what does the geometry look like uh what do the internal cavities look like but for the most part i'll say the traditional methods of cleaning will work at that stage but it's important of what's happened before and looking at the kind of the full manufacturing process to say do we need um or maybe not need but does it make sense to combine processes to reduce the cost reduce the time to manufacture the number of steps that we have okay we have, I think we have time for a few more questions too. Um, are there design considerations that need to be made for 3D printed parts that affect cleaning? Yeah, so that's that's an area that we're working on in, in our R&D group. Um, and we're, we're kind of working on this every day. We're working with different, different groups, especially over in Europe, um, on trying to set what are design parameters and considerations? There's a whole side of additive um, that I'm not gonna get into. This is an additive presentation, but there is the side that goes on to, there's a whole section called design for additive. And what that means is there's a whole different approach when you design these parts um, that you need to take verse when you look at a subtractive manufacturing, you know, or you look at a casting and then a machining process. So you really have to think differently when you design these. And if just because we can design something doesn't mean we should <laughs> that it will work. Mm -hmm. You get too complex of cavities, too long, too small, different things like this. These are kind of these design principles that we are trying to work on um, and feedback 
to some of the additive uh, community as we can on, you know, there, there's, there's decades and decades of subtractive manufacturing do's and don'ts. You know, as we move more into these production parts for additive, it's one of those things that needs to be established for the entire industry. Right. Okay. Are these new cleaning processes more expensive than traditional methods? Um, as a standalone unit, some of these uh, cleaning processes are actually can be cheaper uh, because they don't have all the the filtration and things behind them. But when you look at a full manufacturing process itself, you know when you a lot of the times when what we looked at some of these are additional processes. So in that sense, it's more expensive to clean a part. It's not that the actual cleaning that specific cleaning process is more expensive, but it's the entire process. So you know that gets back into how can we re combine processes together to you know make machines do multi multi tasks. Uh, you know, it reduces the control systems and the overall costs involved. Okay. Is there a limit to the size of parts being processed with these new processes? Uh, right now, we, we've got anything from, from very small parts, call it, uh, you know, an inch or two, all the way up to large aerospace components. And, you yeah. know, just kind of, there, there does become a limit on certain processes when you look at maybe some of the dry cleaning processes. If it's too big, you know, it, it gets hard to, say, create a vortex over, um, say a turbine for, you know, a jet engine or something like that. But it, it definitely, it, there's considerations to take, but for the most part, it doesn't matter too much. Okay. What contact angle is required on the surface of parts? <laughs> so this kind of goes back to, to dyne level. I think a lot of people have the idea on a dyne level that's, that's okay uh, to use. And it, contact angle actually becomes it's subjective, or I'll say not subjective, but it, it, it kind of correlates to what the process is that you're doing. But generally, um, you know, we find you, you need something um, of less than 40 degrees uh, for strong adhesion and bonding processes. Okay. So that's all the time we have for the webinar today. Uh, we hope you found it helpful. Now on behalf of the Parts Cleaning Conference and our sponsor, Echo Clean Group, thanks for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.